Hey there, everybody, and welcome. Today, I'm going to be teaching and playing through a partial solo competitive game of The Great Wall, the base game, uh, designed by Kamil Cisla, Robert Plesowitz, and Wukash Vladarczyk, with astounding art by Piotr Gacic. My apologies if I'm totally mispronouncing any of those names. My reason for creating this video is to provide both a, a, a watch it play style tutorial and a visual rulebook on how to play both the solo and multiplayer competitive version of The Great Wall. As extraordinary as the game is, I have to say its weak link is its rulebook. Now fortunately, uh, Robert and Wukash are both present on the forum on practically a daily basis, helping to clarify misunderstandings and misinterpretations, address every and all question. But I also heard that Awakened Realms might be working on a rewrite of the rule book, but I'm not certain about that or its timing. Now in this video, as I said, I'm going to be covering the core competitive game. Perhaps in a future video, I'll tackle things like uh, the co-op or black powder expansion, but today it's all base game. Now, as, as always the case with my videos, I'm going to be presenting this tutorial with the use of a program I wrote to play the game. The advantage of my using my program is that you're not only going to see everything that happens up close, but more importantly, my program is going to help ensure that I don't miss any steps or play the game incorrectly. The key word there in that sentence is help. While I hope my program plays perfectly, it's certainly possible that I let a bug slip through. If anybody spots any errors, please, I would hope that you would comment on it so I can document any problems in the show notes. Now, I need to say right up front, as I always do, that if you're not familiar with my YouTube channel, I write all the programs uh, that I do for my own personal enjoyment. I have only officially released two of them because I got the, the approval of the respective designers and publishers. So, so please don't ask for a copy of this program because I, I just can't make it available due to the obvious copyright restrictions. Also, as beautiful as this game is in person, my program is a little quick and dirty, so I hope you don't expect anything that does the game justice, graphically speaking. I will intentionally be making horrifically bad plays in this tutorial in an effort to demonstrate the various aspects of the game, so don't watch this for an example of uh, optimal play by any stretch of the imagination. And while my video is going to focus around a solo playthrough, it should still be very helpful to anyone who wants to learn the multiplayer competitive rules. That's because the solo game of The Great Wall is really a three-player game between you and two AI players, who I affectionately like to call Dumb and Dumber. A dumb, in this case, being Chin Ju Xiao, who puts up a valiant fight, actually, and cheats like the devil. And Dummer is the Reed Clan, a true dummy player that doesn't even bother trying to score points. Now, these AI opponents were designed in such a way as to help uh, streamline and simulate a normal competitive version of the game. Whether or not the design team was fully successful in doing so is a video for another day. But my intent here is to focus on the rules, both for solo, two-player, and three or more player games, and to help illustrate how the game flows from one phase to the next. I will say that this game for a typical solo player is going to be a bit of a challenge. It's a complicated game to begin with. And on top of that, you not only have to play your own game, but you have to follow a, a set of a distinct set of rules for both Chin Ju Xiao and a separate set of rules for the Reed Clan. They each play in a very singular way. As a result, the game is ripe, I guess, with opportunity to forget things or skip steps, mess up on scoring, or simply just do something incorrectly. The more organized, the more studious, the more careful you are when it comes to following the many phases of the game, probably the better your results will be. That's where my program is really going to come in handy, because it's not at all forgetful, and it's not going to miss a beat. Anyway, with that in mind, let's get underway. Now, as you can see, I will be the, well, you know, let's make me the red player today. 
the dragon clan. Chin Ju Xiao, uh, the smarter of the two dummy players who will be scoring points, is going to be playing green, the turtle clan. And the lowly reed clan will be playing with the yellow pieces in this game, the snake clan. Check out the full index of timestamps in the show notes if you want to review a specific aspect of the game's rules. The Great Wall, in general, is a game about battling the Mongolian hordes in, I guess, something like 13th century China. In the competitive game, players compete for honor but must work together to some degree to help erect barricades and, more importantly, portions of the Great Wall of China in order to battle the invading Mongols. Now, before getting fully underway, I have to complete the tail end of setup here. As you can see, each human player is dealt two generals at the end of setup and two advisors. The first thing the human player has to do is choose which general they want to play with, and then they'll discard the other. Your general prov provides you with a special ability, dictates things like your starting collection of resources, and where you're going to fall in the turn order, or the T order, it's, as it's referred to in the game. Each human player also examines the two advisors they were dealt, and chooses one to be their active advisor, the, the source of another asymmetric special ability. And the advisor that they don't choose to be active will become their supporting advisor, the card that will be simply flipped over and splayed face down under the general's card, thereby boosting the general's special ability. In my case, for general, I've been dealt Kai Chang uh, right off the bat. Again, my, please accept my standing apology here for my horrific pronunciation of Chinese names. Uh, over here, we have Kang Xian Seng. Kai's ability is uh, each time a location is activated, you score two honor for each supporting advisor. That's the advisor cards that are flipped over and splayed underneath the general card. So you start with one. Uh, for each supporting advisor you have, if there are at least two of your clerks in that location. If I chose Kai to be my general, I would start the game with five wood, five stone, four gold, two chi, one tactic card, and I would have a T order value of 69. The higher your T order value, the better your chances of being first in turn order. That is, if you're playing with other humans. In a normal multiplayer game, the starting turn order is determined based on each player's choice of general. The player with the highest T order value is the player who will be going first in turn order. The player with the second highest T order value will be going second. The player with the lowest T order value will be going last in turn order. So in a two-player game with the Reed Clan as the third solo dummy player, when you're playing two human players, one versus the other, the Reed Clan always starts the game by going last. The two human players go first and second based on whoever has the highest T order going in. In a solo game like this one with the Reed Clan and Shinju Shao, the Reed Clan is always going to be last in turn order at the beginning of the game. Chin will always start out second turn in turn order. And the human player, I, will always be going first, regardless of which general I choose and regardless of what his or her T order value happens to be. Kang's ability is you may use gold as any resource. In the, for, in the overseer income step, gain two gold for each one of your supporting advisors, which for the time being would be a total of two gold unless or until I hire additional supporting advisors beyond the one I started the game with. In addition, if I chose Kang, Sien Seng, uh, to be my general, he provides roughly the same amount of the four starting resources, four uh, wood, six stone, three gold, two chi. Though he doesn't give me any tactic card, and he has a dismally low T order value of two. So if I were playing against other humans and I chose him to be my general, most likely I'd be going last in T order, last in turn order. 
which is probably not surprising since uh, he can treat gold as a wild resource. But again, because I'm playing a solo game here, that low T order value is not going to prove to be problematic for me. Before I choose a general, let's check out the advisors here uh, to see if there are any obvious synergies. So the Chronicler over here on the left provides an additional two honor whenever a horde is defeated, as long as you have one soldier on that horde card. And the Glory Stealer says, uh, each time you deal the last wound to a horde, you may discard one shame token. I think I am going to choose Kang Sien Sang for my general, and then the Chronicler is going to be my active supporting advisor, so Glory Stealer will be flipped face down and be my sole starting supporting advisor for my general. Now in my program, I don't actually show the supporting advisors, I just show a number here next to the general's card. So this just indicates that I have one supporting advisor, and my active advisor is the chronicler, which is sitting up here. Here, of course, are my resources, my four wood, six stone, three gold, and two chi, and I don't have any tactic cards. But I am going first. Here's the Tior track. And my T marker is on top, Chin's green is in the middle, and the Reed Clan's yellow T marker is at the bottom. As you can see, I have split the game board into two separate halves in my program. The worker placement half of the game board is over here on the left, and the half of the board containing the walls and the horde cards is over here on the right. I begin the game with a complement of five clerks, my workers if you will, ten spearmen, two horsemen, and four archers. I also have three additional clerks in the location called the Emperor's Embassy, and if I go to that location, one of the things I can do there is, is uh, to recruit additional clerks so I have more workers on hand. Chin Ju Xiao and probably I'm just going to try to stick to calling him Chin from now on. So he has his own general card, as you can see here. He starts the game with two supporting advisors, all eight of his clerks. Remember, I only have five clerks with three in the Emperor's Embassy, but he starts with all eight. He starts with ten spearmen, two horsemen, and four archers, just like I do. However, his two horsemen and two of his spearmen start the game as overseers here on the worker placement side of the board. I'll talk more about overseers in relatively short order, but for all intents and purposes, he has a spearman here as an overseer in the lumber mill, another spearman as an, uh, as an overseer in the quarry, a horseman as an overseer in the gold mine, and another horseman as the overseer in the temple. So these units, these soldiers, will be overseers for the entire course of the game. They will never be used in any other way. Finally, if we look at the Reed Clan, the Reed Clan only starts with 10 spearmen and only three clerks. He's never going to have fewer or more than just those three clerks, and those three clerks actually start on the game board. One is put into the lumber mill, one is put into the quarry, and its third is in the gold mine. You also start a new game of the Great Wall with 10 shame tokens per human player in a shame pool. There's only me, but if we were playing a two-player game with the Reed Clan as the dummy third player, the shame pool would start at 20. And if this was a true human multiplayer game of three players, we'd start with a shame pool of 30, 40 in a four-player game. The game is played over six rounds or years. So here's the round track over here. As the human player, I have to follow the rules pretty much exactly as written. On the other hand, the two dummy players will cheat, as I said, in order to lessen the load on the person who's playing solo. As I already mentioned, the Reed Clan doesn't score points and neither the Reed Clan nor Chin collect 
resources or advisors or tactic cards. Aside from the fact that Chin does start with two supporting advisors beneath his general and will collect additional supporting advisors over the course of the game. For a human player, the number of supporting advisors you have serves as a boost to the special ability offered by your general. So in my case, my general's ability is that I may not only use gold as a resource, but in the overseer income step, I will gain two gold in addition per supporting advisor I have. So with my one supporting advisor, I'll gain two gold. If I recruit a second supporting advisor, I'll collect four gold during every overseer income step and so forth. In the case of Qin Zhushao, the solo bot, the number of his supporting advisors pretty much impacts how strong his various actions are. On the game board over here, there are two different types of worker placement locations. There are regular locations, which have a discrete number of red worker placement spots where workers or clerks, as they're referred to in the game, are placed. The four resource gathering locations are the lumber mill, which produces wood, the quarry, which produces stone, the gold mine, which produces gold, and the temple, which produces chi. There's also the War Academy regular location where you can go to collect more tactic cards. Those are cards that you can play to break the rules of the game somewhat. There are only two worker placement spots at the, work, at the uh, War Academy. The sixth regular worker placement location would be the Tea House way up here. And you go there anytime you want to change the turn order. In addition to the six regular locations, there are also special worker placement locations where any number of workers can be placed by any number of players. I guess arguably the most important of those special locations would be the barracks, a location where you can go to recruit soldiers to attack the Mongolian hordes. There's also the builder's encampment over here, which is a special location where you can build barricades and sections of the walls. The aforementioned uh, Emperor's Embassy down here, where you can acquire additional clerks and advisors. And uh, the Logistics Center up at the top, a location that lets you redeploy soldiers from one wall section to another. Speaking of wall sections, in a solo and a two-player game, you only play with two wall sections. You effectively block off the first wall section, the entire column. The rules suggest you just cover with barricade tokens to remind you, but it's pretty easy to remember that you just don't play with this wall section. You only play with two wall sections. In a normal three or more player game, you play with all three wall sections. We start the game with no parts of the wall built up, but we do have three barricades in place in each wall section. Each barricade provides a defensive amount of protection of a value of two. So my defensive strength in each of these walls uh, currently stands at six, two times three. At the beginning of the game, two randomly drawn horror cards were placed directly opposite those sets of barricades. That's the way you begin a solo or a two-player game. If you were playing with three human players, all three of the wall sections would be active, and you would draw three whore cards to fill the front row. In a four-player game, you draw a fourth whore card, and, and where you put it, I'll actually discuss that later in the video. Over here on the left, we have pikemen which offer a total of six offensive strength against the wall, shown here in the bottom left corner of the card. The six defense of the R3 barricades currently is going to be able to hold off the pikemen, keep them at bay. Also, if you claim the pikemen horde card, if you defeat it and claim it and bring it into your player area, it could potentially be worth six honor to you, basically six points, at the end of the game. In the rightmost wall section, we have brutes offering 
a total offense of eight against our three barricades of six. So currently we are at a disadvantage here against the Brutes and we'll need to do something to beef up our defense. Otherwise the wall is going to be breached at some point later in the round. And if you claim the Brute card uh, for your own, uh, it is worth potentially eight honor points at the end of the game. The best way to dive into the game and learn how it works and how it's played is to proceed very slowly through the different seasons and phases of the game, basically the flow of the game, and learn about new things as they arise. So that's what we're going to do. Now, like I said, refer to the index of timestamps to jump to a particular section. If you get lost or need to refresh your memory about something, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Five of the six rounds of the game play through four seasons, starting with spring and ending with the winter season. Round one, however, is different. Uh, round one starts in the fall. Now, I don't think that round one, therefore, is shorter than the rest of the rounds. Truth be told, spring and summer, in, in many respects, are cleanup steps in preparation for the new round. The meat of the game actually happens in the fall. So over here, I indicate that we're playing in the fall, and we're currently in the Choose Command Card step of the fall season. So you can see that this is the entire flow of the game, and I am highlighting what step we're, where we're currently starting the game. In the Choose Command Card step, uh, all players secretly choose one of the six command cards in their hand to play that round. Each player starts with the same hand of six command cards, Attack Order, Betrayal, Despotism, Economy, Raise Banners, and Work Harder. A common theme runs through most of these command cards. Often, the active player will be called upon to do something first. For example, place a number of his or her clerks in worker placement locations then every other player will have the opportunity to place exactly two clerks, but they have to go in two different locations. And then finally, the active player might get to do something special after that in each command card. If we take a look at Qin Zhu Xiao, you see that he too has the same six command cards. However, whereas the command cards of every human player are identical among players, Chins are the same in name only. Because he is a bot player, his version of each command card is actually somewhat different in many respects. So you do have to read through that carefully, and we'll be doing so as we go through this playthrough. The Reed Clan only has one command card, the Reed Clan command card. He, as I said, he's a very simple dummy player, so he just plays the same card year in and year out. So players at this step uh, choose a command card to play, take it from their hand, and place it face down on the table. And once all players have chosen their command cards, they're all revealed simultaneously, and then we move into step two, of the fall phase, which is arrange command cards. So it's no surprise that the Reed clan is going to pick the same command card every time. But what about Chin Zhu Xiao? Well, simple. He takes his six command cards, shuffles them together at the start of the game, well, you do actually, and you choose one at random for him, so you, you never quite know what he has up his sleeve. As he plays command card, you know what's left in his hand, so you'll have a better idea of what, what the odds are of him playing any particular card. Since there are six rounds in the game and Chin starts with a deck of six command cards, you might think he's set for the entire length of the game. But in fact, one of his command cards, the trail, has him reshuffle all of his command cards that were previously discarded, with the exception of Betrayal. So, therefore, in every solo game, Chin is guaranteed to play Betrayal once. And each other command card might be played once or possibly twice over the course of a solo game. Or possibly not at all, depending upon when Chin plays Betrayal and you reshuffle all the command cards and start dealing them all over again. Anyway, let's proceed. Now, for no particular reason, 
I'm going to start uh, the game off by playing Despotism. And then from his shuffled hand of command cards, Chin's going to draw the top one. Work harder. And of course, the Reed Clan plays its one and only command card. So, as I mentioned, this brings us into step two of the fall phase, a range command card. So the players have revealed what command cards they're going to be playing. They've laid them face up on the table. And in T order, in turn order, that is, each player decides when they want to play their card by positioning it on the command track, which actually is located over here uh, to the right of the rightmost Horde cards. They're actually placed off the edge of the board. So since I'm at the top of the T order stack, I can choose to go first or last or in the middle. Let's actually get to the arrange command step. Okay, so here are the command cards that were all played. And now I have to choose if I want to go first, second, or third uh, in command order. After that, the player who is second in T order is going to choose one of the two remaining positions, and the person who's going last will just get whatever's left over. Chinju Shao and the Reed Clan choose in the same way. They simply place their command cards in the first available open position. So if I decided to go last, Chin would choose to go first, and the Reed Clan would naturally go second. However, I think I'm going to choose to go first. So therefore, Chin's going to go second, and the Reed Clan will go last. And that takes us into step three of the fall phase. The player turns, uh, which consists of three steps, all of which are repeated for each player in the game. So in this case, we'll first perform my command step, during which we'll resolve all the actions on my chosen command card, Despotism, from top to bottom. Then we'll move into my activation step, during which we'll activate any and all regular locations that are fully occupied, as well as any and all special locations that have at least one clerk placed there. Although when you're playing a solo or two-player game with the Reed Clan, there is a special extra rule added. A special location, one like the barracks or the builder's encampment, if it's only occupied by the Reed Clan clerk and no other player's clerks, then that special location will not activate during the activation step. So the Reed Clan doesn't activate a location if it's the only occupant. That's the one exception for a one or two player game. Now, I'll, I'll certainly be talking more specifically about how you activate a location and what happens during the activation step a little later in the video. Clearly, each location activates a little differently. There's one other thing that human players need to be thinking about when it comes to a location's activation. When a location is marked with a shame flag, and that would be any of the resource gathering locations like the lumber mill. So here's the shame flag in the lumber mill. There's one in the quarry. There's one in the gold mine. And there's one in the temple. And there's also one in the special location barracks. If the human player is the only occupant in uh, one of those locations when it activates, then that human player is going to gain a shame token for performing a shameful act. I guess you can imagine that it's shameful for clerks not to cooperate. Any shame tokens I gain uh, have to immediately be placed in one of two locations, either under one of my soldiers, be it a spearman, a horseman, or an archer, or on the back of a whore card that I might have in my possession. You'll see how all this works later on. I'll make sure I gain at least some shame over the course of the game. When a soldier is marked with a shame token, it's disabled, and the soldier can't be used in the game. In addition, at the end of the game, you're going to lose five honor points for each of your soldiers marked with a shame token. Uh, furthermore, if you ever have to take a shame token when the shame pool itself is empty, then you're forced immediately to lose five honor points right on the spot. Also, if you gain a shame token and you have no valid place to put it because you're just overloaded with shame, 
then you simply remove the shame token from the game and you still lose 500 points. So there's no way around it. One way or another, it's going to get you. So shame tokens are certainly something you, you want to avoid, if at all possible. Fortunately, there is a way to get rid of shame tokens, and we'll talk about that later in the video. You might also recall that at, at, uh, at the start of the game, I could have chosen as my active advisor to be Glory Stealer. As I recall, Glory Stealer had, gave me an ability that would allow me to discard a shame token. So there are other ways to get rid of shame tokens, uh, advisors being specifically one of them. Since only regular locations that have all their spaces filled with clerks will be activated, it's possible that some clerks may remain where they are throughout the round or even across rounds. That's why in a, in a human multiplayer game of the Great Wall, oftentimes there's a bit of wheeling and dealing going on. A little bit of, if you promise to place a clerk here to support me, I'll promise to place a clerk over here to support you. If you ever feel that one of your clerks is misplaced or is going to be stuck in some location that's not getting filled up, when it's your turn to place a clerk, you can also choose to relocate a clerk instead, just moving it from the location it currently occupies to a new location. You can choose to do that, relocate one of your clerks instead of placing a new one from your supply, as long as it's not in a regular location that is fully occupied and is therefore set to activate in an upcoming activation step. If it's your turn to place a clerk and all your clerks are already on the board, you're going to be forced to relocate one of them or simply decide to stop placing clerks. A player's turn ends with the Horde Defeat Check Step. I'm just kind of giving you a brief overhaul of what's going to be happening and then we'll play it in detail. After my Horde Defeat Check Step is complete, then my turn will be over and Shin Zhushao will pr proceed to perform his Automated Command Step his, followed by his activation step, and followed by his Horde Defeat check step. And then finally, the Reed Clan plays through all three steps as well. Only then will we move on to the winter phase. So that's why I said the fall phase is the meat of the game, where all the actions and player turns take place. So here we are at the beginning of my command step. And here's my despotism card over here on the right. And you can see that the first thing that happens is that I move up to four of my clerks to any locations. Any locations. I can even double them up, triple them up in any one location, whatever I want. For each economy card on the command track that might have been played by another player, I get to place two additional clerks. Now, in our case, we know that Chin played work harder, not economy. So I am only going to be able to place four of my clerks. I'm using the word place, but the command cards themselves use the word move, meaning you're moving a clerk either from your supply or from another location on the board to a different location on the board. Well, considering that gold is a wild resource for me, I think I probably should start the game by trying to amass a lot of it. So I'm going to begin by placing three of my clerks in the gold mine. One, two, three. And remember the Reed Clan already has a clerk in the gold mine because that was put there during setup. I have one more clerk to place and I will place it in the barracks. And then I'm going to pause the game because then we're going to be moving into the second step of the command card where every other player gets to move up to two of their clerks to any two different locations. Okay, so I pause the game. I have three of my clerks in the gold mine along with the Reed Clan's one clerk. Reed Clan also has a clerk in the quarry and the lumber mill. One of my clerks is in the special location, the barracks, where I, any number of players and clerks can be placed. And now Chin, who is second in turn order, followed by the Reed Clan, who is last in turn order, uh, each of them will get to move up to two of their clerks to any two different locations. So how does Chin Zhushao go about deciding where he wants to place his clerks? Well, at the start of a solo game, 
you take one wood, one stone, one gold, one sheet token, and one wound marker, and you randomly place them in the location track. There are five boxes on Chin Ju Shao's general card down here. Because Chin's uh, card is not always showing in my program, I also display the location track here. The lower end of the track that General Chin cares most about is over here on the right side. And the resources that are further to the left, Chin cares less about. So in our example, the wound marker is furthest to the right. And since Chin is now ready to place two clerks in two different locations, well, one of them is going to go to the barracks because the wound marker represents the barracks. So he's going to place one clerk there. If he had his druthers, he'd be happy to place another clerk there, but he can't. He has to place them in two different locations. So therefore, he looks to the next location on his location track and puts a clerk there. So his second clerk is going to go into the lumber mill. As long as the lumber mill wasn't fully occupied, he'd be able to go there. If it was fully occupied, he'd have to move on to the gold mine instead. Uh, and from there, move on to, to the temple and finally to the quarry. So Chin only cares about those five locations, the lumber mill, the quarry, the gold mine, the temple, and the barracks. And the order in which he cares about them is prioritized based on the tokens in the location track. So really, when it comes to placing clerks, it's pretty easy to determine what Shin's priorities are, what he's going to do. And you can actually plan your strategy to a certain extent around what you know Chin is going to do on his turn. Anyway, let's unpause the game now so you can see Chin place a clerk on his own in the barracks and then one in the lumber mill. Now, again, if you're playing solo, clearly you're doing this on his behalf. One in the barracks, one in the lumber mill. And now it's the Reed Clan's turn to place two clerks in any two different locations. The Reed Clan doesn't have any specific rules, per se, for placing clerks. Its actions are always chosen by the Overlord, the player who is currently the active player, or in the case when the Reed Clan is the active player, the Overlord is the player who is higher in T order. Since I'm currently the active player right now, because we're playing my command card, Despotism, I get to decide which two different locations I want the Reed Clan to occupy. Now, the Reed Clan only has three clerks, and those three clerks are always on the game board at all times. So placing a Reed Clan clerk always means moving it from one location to another. The Reed Clan has one other rule associated with them. You can never have more than one Reed Clan clerk in a single location. So the three Reed Clan clerks have to always occupy three different locations on the board, even if the command card doesn't require that they be different. That's just a special rule having to do with the Reed Clan. Well, maybe I prefer that the Reed Clan had a clerk in the barracks. So in that case, for one of his two placements, I might choose to move one of his clerks there. Why don't we take the clerk from the quarry and move it to the barracks. So that will be the first of Reed Clan's two clerk placements that I get to choose because I'm currently the active player. Okay. And now as the overlord, I can move uh, one other Reed Clan clerk to any location. But the truth is, I'm probably okay with his occupying the lumber mill and the gold mine and the barracks at this point. So I'm just going to choose to not use his second clerk placement. So I'm going to click cancel. And now we're going to move on to my third step on my despotism command card. Where I get to perform an advanced activation in any one location. So what's an advanced activation? Well, it, an advanced activation is the same as a regular activation, except for two things. One, the location, if it's a regular location, doesn't have to be full. So, for example, I can choose to activate the gold mine now, even though it's not fully occupied. The other thing about uh, an advanced activation is that 
you never suffer shame if you're the only occupant in that location. So that's one way to get around that shame rule is by performing an advanced activation. And again, that only applies to regular and special locations that have the shame flag token displayed near it. The location that I want to activate as an advanced activation, I'm going to choose the gold mine because I want to get my gold sooner rather than later. When we get to the activation step, the gold mine would not normally activate because it's not fully occupied. The procedure you follow when activating one of the four resource gathering locations pretty much is the same for each one. So I'm going to describe that activation step now. There are five steps involved, so it sounds a little complicated, but you'll get the hang of it pretty quickly. Step one In T order, each human player with one or more clerks present gains one of the resource for each clerk that they have there plus a bonus of one two or three extra resources if a player has an overseer on the first second or third overseer box so for example if I had an overseer here in the gold mine in the first box then I would collect one two three plus one gold for a total of four and each player can have at most one overseer in each of the four locations, the lumber mill, quarry, gold mine, and the temple. When you first hire an overseer, it's placed in the first box. You, pay, you have to pay two of some resource, generally, like I would have to pay two stone to hire my uh, overseer in the gold mine. And then perhaps in a later turn, I could choose to upgrade that overseer to the second level by paying three additional stone. And then later in the game, I could choose to upgrade that overseer to the third and final level by paying an additional four stone at that time. If a player has an overseer in a location but doesn't have a clerk there, then generally speaking, that player is not gonna gain anything. You have to have at least one clerk present in the location when it activates for you to be able to participate in the activation of the location. In my case, I have three clerks there, but no overseer, so I'm simply going to gain three gold. The Reed clan, who has one clerk there, remember, he doesn't collect resources. And frankly, neither does Chin Ju Shao. So if he had a clerk there, he wouldn't collect resources either. But if Chin had one or more clerks present at a resource gathering location that was activating, he would instead score a number of honor points equal to the number of his clerks there times the level of his overseer. If I chose to activate the lumber mill instead of the gold mine, then the Reed clan wouldn't gain anything, but Chin would score one times one or one point for his one clerk at the lumber mill. But we're over here at the gold mine. Chin's not there. Reed Clan doesn't get anything, so the only thing that really happens in step one of the activation step is that I'm going to gain three gold. So I went from three gold to six gold. The second step of the activation process of a resource gathering location is again in T order. Each player who has one or more clerks present may choose to hire or upgrade their overseer if they're willing to pay whatever the cost happens to be, and if they have a soldier that they can give up who will serve the role of the overseer. Remember, you can't choose a soldier who's marked with a shame token. Once a soldier becomes an overseer, it's permanently going to be that overseer in that particular location for the remainder of the game. So you have to balance the advantage of having an overseer in a location and gaining extra resources during the activation there with the fact that you now have one fewer soldier available to you to fight the Mongolian hordes. In my case, I'm more than willing to give up a spearman to serve as an overseer at the gold mine. The cost to hire that overseer is two stone. I have six stone to my name, so that's not going to be a problem. I can easily afford that. So I am going to, uh, uh, during the overseer step now, choose to pay the two stone and give up one spearman 
so that in the future when the gold mine is activated and I have a clerk there, I'm going to gain one extra gold. So I'm going to choose to put a spearman there. I'm down to nine spearmen and my spearman is placed in the first box and I've paid my two stones so I'm now down to four stone. Note that during this overseer step the Reed clan never hires an overseer, never upgrades one. And Chin Ju Shao, who started the game with an overseer, he does not upgrade his overseers during the overseer step. He upgrades them in a different way. In step three of the activation process, again in T order, each human player who has one or more clerks present may choose to donate one of the resources they just gained to the warehouse, which is located up here. If you do, donate one of the resources you just gained. So I would have to donate the gold if I wanted to make a donation. I would score two honor points. Now this step is ignored when activating the temple since you can't donate chi to the warehouse. The only thing you could ever put in the warehouse is wood, stone, and gold. If the Reed clan has a clerk present at the location, which is the case here in the gold mine, it will always donate one resource to the warehouse, in this case one gold. You'd simply take a gold from the supply and place it on the warehouse space. Of course, the Reed Clan doesn't score honor for doing that. Chin never donates to the warehouse. At this point, I'm going to choose not to make a donation. So the only thing that's going to happen now is that the Reed Clan will donate one gold to the warehouse because the Reed Clan has a clerk located there. So I'm going to say no, but the Reed Clan puts one gold into the warehouse from the supply. Step four, if you were the only player with clerks at that location, as I said, and this was a normal activation, you would gain one shape token now. But this is an advanced activation and not a normal activation. And, he, and even if it was, I wasn't the only player with clerks at the gold mine, so I wouldn't gain a shape token anyway. Finally, step five. All players, with the exception of the Reed Clan, return their clerks from that location back to their supply. So as you can see, my three clerks have been removed from the gold mine automatically and returned. But the Reed Clan's clerk stays right where it is. The Reed Clan clerks never leave the game board. And those are the five steps involved when activating one of these four uh, resource gathering locations. So in summary, in turn order, each player gains one resource for each clerk they have there, plus a possible bonus of one, two, or three additional resources if they have an overseer at that location. In a solo game, Chin instead scores a number of honor points equal to the number of clerks he has there times the level of his overseer, be it one, two, or three. Next, in T order, you can give up one soldier and pay the cost of two resources to hire an overseer at that location. But if you previously hire an overseer, then you would only have to pay whatever the additional cost is to upgrade that overseer. It costs two, three, or four chi to upgrade an overseer at the lumber mill, two, three, or four wood to upgrade an overseer at the quarry, we already saw two, three, or four stone to upgrade an overseer at the gold mine, and two, three, or four gold to upgrade an overseer at the temple. As a reminder, you can never have more than one overseer per location. Next in turn order, in the case of the lumber mill, the quarry, and the gold mine, but not the temple, each human player with at least one clerk present may donate one of the resources they just gained to the warehouse in exchange for two honor. You can't pay two resources to the warehouse and gain four honor. You can only choose to either donate one or not donate it at all. And if the Reed Clan has a clerk at that location, it always adds one resource from the supply to the warehouse. Chin never donates. Next, if a human player is the only player with a clerk present and it's a regular activation, not an advanced activation, then that human player is going to gain one shame token from the shame pool. And then finally, all players, with the exception of the Reed Clan, have their clerks returned to their respective supplies. 
and that completes my command step. So we've gone top to bottom in order. I first moved four of my clerks, then the then Shin and the Reed clan moved two of theirs to any two different locations, and then finally I got to advance activate one location. And now it's time for my activation step. In the activation step, any regular locations that are full will activate, and any special locations that have at least one clerk there will also activate, as long as the special location is not solely occupied by one single Reed Clan clerk. If the Reed Clan's in a special location by itself, it's just not going to activate. If multiple locations are going to be activating during the activation step, then the active player gets to choose the order in which those locations get activated. In our case, there's only one location that's going to activate during the activation step, and that is the barracks. So I'm going to continue on to the activation step now, activating the barracks. And since I'm at the top of the T order, I get to go first. And I only have one clerk there, so I can only recruit one soldier be it a spearman, an archer, or a horseman. Recruiting a soldier means that I choose a soldier that I, I know I have available in my supply, and one that doesn't have a shame token under it. I make certain I can pay the cost of recruiting that soldier. I pay the cost in total across all the soldiers I might be recruiting, and they take all those soldiers, and with each one, I either attack a horde card with it, or I place that soldier in the rest zone of a wall section. What does it mean to attack a horde card? Well, if I'm attacking with a little spearman, it means I place that spearman on an empty spot showing a reward on a horde card that is in the first row, meaning the row closest to the barricades. Spearmen are on foot. After all, they can't attack hordes that are further away from the wall. They get, they get massacred. So they can only attack the first row of horde cards. And they would only take up one space. So you would cover one space and earn the, uh, the reward shown. So you might here get two honor. Here you get two honor. Here you get one gold. Over here you get one wood. And over here, either you get two honor or one gold, depending upon where you place the spearman. You can't place a spearman on a blank space. It has to go on a space that shows a reward, and it has to be a space that doesn't already have a soldier there or any other kind of token. As soon as I cover up the space with the spearman, I earn the reward shown, be it one resource or two honor points. On the other hand, if I'm attacking with a horseman, well, it works the same way as a spearman, except horsemen are bigger, and I get to cover up two empty adjacent spots, either horizontally adjacent or vertically adjacent. And both spots that are covered by the horseman have to be empty and have to both show a, a reward. So I can't place a horseman so it covers up one reward on a blank space or if it hangs over the edge of a horde card, you can't do that. And I can't place a horseman diagonally either. It's got to be either horizontally um, or vertically arranged. So when I attack with a horseman, therefore, I'm going to be earning two rewards. And because horsemen are cavalry, I can even attack horde cards that are further away from the front line. I'm not limited to those that are in the front row. Finally, if I'm attacking with a newly recruited archer, I have to choose a wall section that has an empty red space on the wall that can hold the archer. So right now there's no watchful walls built, but there is one space for an archer at each of these two wall sections. And when I fire an arrow, I take a wound token from the supply, and I just cover up one of the spaces in any whore card in that wall section. The arrows can fly all the way to the back or hit somebody in the front. It doesn't matter. However, the wound tokens are just generic wound tokens. It's not really marked as a wound that I made. And also, when archers wound a horde, 
you don't collect the reward that you cover up with that wound token. So the only time you're going to get a reward is when you actually put a soldier on a space, not a wound token. You also have to be aware that some horde cards might show special rules on them that have to be obeyed. For instance, there is a horde card called Shield Bearers that can't be attacked with archers because, well, their shields block the arrows. I said earlier that when you're recruiting a soldier, you either attack with it or the other option is to place it in a rest zone. Each of the three wall sections, or in our game, the two wall sections, has a rest zone below it. So this is the rest zone back here for the middle wall section. And this is the rest zone back here for the rightmost wall section. I've actually cut off the rest zone for the first wall section. Why would you want to place a soldier in a rest zone instead of attacking with it immediately? There might be a variety of reasons. If it was a spearman, for example, I might not like the rewards that are available to me on the whore card that's in the front row. There are a variety of reasons for stationing soldiers in rest zones instead of attacking with them immediately. And when the time comes that I can attack with the soldiers I've placed in the rest zone, the attack works the same way. I'm limited to attacking hordes in the specific wall section. I can't attack with spearmen farther back than the front row. And I can't attack with archers unless there's an empty red firing spot on the wall where I can place it. At present, no sections of the wall have been built up yet, so there's only one firing spot per wall section where an archer can be placed. But as various levels of a wall are erected, more and more red archer firing spots will become available. You'll see that later on when we start building up the wall. Given all that, for my turn at the barracks, my one clerk's going to let me recruit one soldier. So for the sake of example, I think I'm going to choose to recruit an archer at a cost of two chi and one wood. Now if I wanted to recruit a spearman, I'd be paying two stone and one wood. If I wanted to recruit a horseman, I'd have to pay three gold and one wood. And once again, remember, if you have multiple clerks at the barracks, you choose all the soldiers you want to recruit, one recruit per clerk, and you pay the total across all the various soldiers. So that if there is a discount of some sort that's afforded you because of some other card, it's applied to the total, not to each individual recruit. So I'm going to recruit an archer for a total cost of two chi and one wood. I can easily afford that, of course. And when you recruit, you either immediately attack with that recruit or you uh, place an arrest zone. I am going to immediately attack the brutes in the rightmost wall section. So I'm going to click OK. The cost deducted from my resources. And now I'm going to find a place for that wound token over here somewhere on the brutes card. Remember, I'm not going to get two honor or one gold depending upon where I place it. When you place a generic wound token you don't get the reward. I will simply cover up this first space and the archer will leave my supply and occupy that red firing spot on the wall. Okay, so there's my archer. Now I have only three archers in my supply. There's the wound token that is now permanently covering that space, but I did not gain two honor. Next in T order at the barracks is Chin, who is in T second place in turn order. So what's he going to do? When he's at the barracks, Chin always recruits one spearman for each clerk he's placed there. And he first tries to attack the horde card pointed to by the current invasion indicator. The invasion indicator refers to an icon on the back of each horde card that refers either to the second wall section or the third wall section or the first wall section if you're playing a normal three or four player game with human players. 
But when you're playing a solo or a two-player game, you first remove all the whore cards from the deck with an invasion indicator that points at the first wall section because that wall section is completely ignored in games involving one or two players. So when you're looking for the current invasion indicator, you simply look at the face-down horde card on the top of the horde deck. In our case, it looks like this. So there are 14 cards in the horde deck, and the top one has the invasion indicator pointing to the space, the wall on the far right. So in this case, Chin is going to recruit a Spearman, obviously at no cost because it doesn't pay resources or collect them, and it's going to attack the Horde card in the rightmost wall section uh, at the very front row. If there was no Horde card there, or if that Horde card, or if, it, if for some reason it couldn't attack that Horde card, then it will try the other wall section. But in this case, it's going to go after the Brutes with its Spearmen, and it's going to cover the first space, top to bottom, left to right. So it's going to come in here and cover this gold space on the far left. So let's unpause. It recruits a Spearman, and it puts it there in that first space. And regardless of whatever the reward space shows, Chin always scores to honor. Now before I move on to the Reed Clan, there's one other thing that we have to talk about, and this is very easy to forget when you're playing solo, so I'm going to stress this repeatedly during this solo playthrough. When you activate a location where Chin Ju Xiao has a clerk, or one or more clerks, and you resolve those clerks for Chin, you have to remember to move the corresponding resource token on the location track all the way to the left and then slide all the other resources to the right. So in this case my program took care of that automatically. As soon as Chin placed his Spearman on that Horde card, the Wound token was moved from the far right over to the far left and all the other tokens slid to the right. So now as far as Chin's concerned, the Barracks is his lowest priority location. So now it's the Reed Clan's turn to recruit a soldier, and since I'm still the Overlord because I'm the active player, I get to choose where the Reed Clan is going to place that Spearman. So we'll have it attack the two honor space uh, diagonally to the right of my wound marker. So I'm going to go after this space here with the Reed Clan Spearman. Again, the Reed Clan doesn't collect any resources or points. So nothing happens other than the fact that you cover that space. So we've completed my command step. We've completed my activation step. The next step is the horde defeat check step, but there are no horde cards that need to be defeated. You would only defeat a horde card when its spaces are fully covered with soldiers or wound tokens. So basically my turn is now over, and we move on to the next player, which would be Chin. Chin's command card, recall, is Work Harder. So as you can see, he's going to move up to a number of clerks equal to the number of his supporting advisors. That's what that scroll icon refers to. And he's going to move them based on the lowest location on his location track. That currently happens to be the lumber mill. He has two supporting advisors. So therefore, he is going to place two clerks, and he'll place as many as he can first in the lumber mill, and then he'll move on to the gold mine if necessary, and then to the temple if necessary. But that's not going to be a problem. He has two clerks to place, and they're both going to go into the lumber mill, and that will fill up that location. One, two. Now... Once again, every other player in T order can move up to two clerks to any two locations of their choice, but they have to be different. Now, I would actually like to have another clerk in my arsenal of five clerks, so I'm going to go and place a clerk in the Emperor's Embassy, which would allow me to recruit another clerk. And my second clerk has to go in a different location. 
So I will choose to place it in the barracks. And I'm going to pause again because now it's the Reed clan's turn. Since Chin is currently the active player, he's going to take on the role of the overlord when it comes time to direct the Reed clan. And he's going to simply adapt the same strategy he uses for himself when directing what the Reed clan clerk should do. But it has to stick to the Reed clan's rules of not having more than one clerk in any one location. Well, Highest priority location for Chin is the lumber mill, but that's full. And anyway, the Reed Clan already has a clerk there. The next highest priority location is the gold mine. Reed Clan's already there. The next highest location in priority order is the temple. The Reed Clan does not have a clerk there. So Chin is going to find a clerk that belongs to the Reed Clan and move it to the temple. Now, when he looks for a, a Reed Clan clerk to relocate, first he looks in all the locations other than the lumber mill, the quarry, the gold mine, and the temple, and the barracks. He looks at all the other locations he doesn't care about. And he takes Reed Clans from those locations first. If there are no Reed Clans in those locations, then he'll take a Reed Clan clerk from the location that is furthest to the left on his location track in this case the barracks, and he's going to move the Reed Clan clerk to the place where he wants it to be. Well, in this case, he wants it to be in the temple because the Reed Clan's already at the lumber mill and it's already at the gold mine. So when I unpause now, you're going to see that Chin is going to take the Reed Clan clerk that's in the barracks and move it to the temple. Okay, I paused again. If you take a look at the third step of Chin's command card, work harder, it says on the location track, compare stone and gold. If stone is higher, meaning furthest to the left, build the lowest wall you can, be it a level 1 wall, a level 2 wall, or a level 3 wall. However, if gold is higher, you hire the leftmost advisor on the advisor track. We haven't talked about the advisor track there yet, but there are four advisors here on display. And if gold was higher on the location track, then uh, Chin would take the versatile warrior, flip it face down, and place it under his general to serve as a third supporting advisor. In our case, stone is higher than gold, so he is going to build the lowest wall section. He's going to break the tie based on the invasion indicator, which points to this wall section over here. To pay for it, he is going to take the five resources he needs, or whatever is there, at the warehouse. That's what the warehouse is there for. It's used to pay any time a player is erecting a wall or building a barricade. You first fund the cost of the wall or barricade uh, using whatever happens to be in the warehouse. And if there wasn't enough, then the player who's uh, building the wall or building the barricade has to make up the difference. In the case of Chin, of course, he doesn't have any resources, so he's simply going to return the one gold that's in the warehouse back to the supply, and he's going to build the wall over here in the rightmost wall section. like so. Because there was an archer that was already in the red firing spot there, well that archer doesn't go away, it simply gets out of the way while the wall's being built, and then he climbs to the top of the wall. Now you can see that the first wall level has three firing spots on it instead of just one, so the archer just finds a place to uh, get into position. The defensive value of this first wall section is eight, so it's easily going to take care of the brutes now. We're fully protected. And we can see that the cost to build the next level wall section is 10 resources of some type, be it 10, some combination of wood, stone, or gold. You can't pay chi when you're building a wall or building a barricade. And now that Chin has completed his command step, we're going to move on to his activation step. The locations that need to activate are the lumber mill, because it's a regular location that's full, 
the Emperor's Embassy. It's a special location that has at least one clerk there, and it's not just a single Reed Clan clerk. And the barracks is going to activate. Jin prioritizes location where he has clerks, and he activates them in descending order according to his location track from highest to lowest. I, I want to point out here that the rule book is wrong when it says that Chin activates in normal location track order. That is not correct. If you go by Chin's general card, what the general card says is correct. He activates locations in order from the highest to the lowest. So the first location he's going to activate is going to be the lumber mill because that's highest on the location track where he has clerks. In fact, it's the only location where he has clerks. After that, he'll go through from highest to lowest all the locations where he doesn't have clerks. And then finally, he's going to activate whatever is left over. So the lumber mill is going to activate first. The barracks is going to activate second. And lastly, the emperor's embassy will go last. The rules actually say if there are multiple locations that need to activate, once Chin has resolved the five that he cares about, the lumber mill, the quarry, the gold mine, the temple, and the barracks, the human player can decide the order in which to activate them. But truth be told, it probably won't make that much of a difference. So in our case, the lumber mill is going to fire first. During the gather resource step, Chin, who is highest in T order, is going to go first, and he's going to score his clerks times the level of his overseer. So three times one, he's going to score three honor. He already has two honor when he placed his spearman over here on the brute's horde card, so that's going to bump him up to five honor. Once he scores those three honor, we're going to take his wood resource from the location track, shift it all the way to the left, and everything else is going to slide to the right. At the overseer step, nothing's going to happen. At the donation step, the reed clan will donate one wood by taking it from the supply and adding it to the warehouse. Scores three honor for a total of five. Reed clan donates a wood to the warehouse. Chin's clerks are returned to his supply, and the reed clan's clerk stays right where it is and the barracks is activating next. Now notice, by the way, I'm the only player who has a clerk at the barracks, so I'm going to have to gain one shame here. I did promise I would be gaining shame during this tutorial. This time I'm going to choose to recruit a horseman. So it's going to cost me three gold and one wood. I can easily afford that. Click OK. And I'm going to place it. I'm going to place it over here, vertically. So I'm covering both this two honor and the one gold. So I'm going to collect uh, two. I'm going to score two honor and gain one gold back. So ultimately, the horseman only cost me one wood and two gold because I got one gold back from the horde guard. And, as you can see, I've gained a shame because I'm the only human player who has clerks there. So, I don't have a horde card I can place it on, and I haven't even talked about that yet. So, I have to choose a soldier to place that shame token on. I'm just going to choose a spearman and uh, tag that spearman as having shame. And, therefore, I'm without one more spearman right now for the time being. So that brings us to the Emperor's Embassy. That's the last location it has to activate. I guess I can unpause here. And I can either recruit a clerk for two gold. So I could take one of these three clerks and move it to my supply and pay two gold. Or I could choose for my one clerk at the Emperor's Embassy, I could choose to recruit an advisor from the display. And I can, once I choose that advisor, I can decide whether I want it to be an active advisor who will give me another uh, asymmetric uh, special ability I can use. 
or I can choose to make it a supporting advisor, flip them upside down and put them underneath my general card. That choice is important because it is permanent. Once you choose to make an advisor either active or supporting, that's it. They'll be active for the rest of the game or they'll be a supporting advisor for the rest of the game. So I did come here to recruit another clerk, but I'm a little tempted by Jinchi over here. Well, let's take a look at these four advisors. So we have the versatile warrior that says uh, each time you attack with one or more of your horsemen, you may pay one chi extra to deal two additional wounds to the same horde card. Second advisor here is Jinchi. After your command step, you may move one additional clerk. You may place this clerk in a full location if you want to, one that, one that you wouldn't normally be able to place a clerk at. So that's kind of nice. There's Imperial Judge. Each time you draw a tactic card from the deck, you can gain two resources of your choice. And Forest Guide says each time you play a tactic card, you may discard one shame token on a horde card or under a soldier. I did come here to recruit a clerk, but I am tempted to, to recruit Jinchi instead. I do like his ability. That's pretty cool. Uh, I would have to pay one gold for each advisor I currently have, plus one gold for the one I'm about to hire. So I have one supporting advisor currently, one active advisor. I'm about to recruit Jinchi, so I would have to pay three gold to recruit him. I do have four gold, so I have plenty of gold. Uh, I did come here for the clerk, but I think I am going to recruit Jinchi, and I'm going to recruit him to be an active advisor so I get to use his special ability. All the advisors then slide to the left and a new one is drawn to fill in the gap so we've got the survival the survivalist over here each time one or more of your soldiers are killed you may save one of them for free we'll see how that works later on and that pretty much brings chin's turn to an end there is the horde defeat check step but once again no horde cards are covered up so no horde cards need to be defeated as a result, we're going to move on to the Reed Clan's turn, and let's take a look at his one and only command card. He donates two stone from the resource pool. He donates two stone to the resource pool by taking two stone out of the supply and adding it there. And then if there are enough resources in the warehouse, he'll build a wall with them. Now that's different from the way that Chin builds a wall. Remember, Chin didn't care if there were enough resources in the warehouse to build a wall when he was instructed to do so. He just paid for what he could out of the warehouse, and then he built the wall anyway. However, the Reed Clan will not build a wall if it can't afford the lowest wall. In our case, it would need to have five resources available to build the wall here. After donating two stone there, there'll be three resources, but there still won't be enough to build a wall, so we won't. Then, just like always, every other player can move two clerks to any two different locations. And finally, the Reed Clan will perform an advanced activation in each location where he has a Reed Clan clerk. So that's another way you can plan your own clerk strategy because you know that when it's the Reed Clan's turn, he's always going to activate the three locations where he has a clerk placed. So the first thing he's going to do is place two stone in the warehouse. Nothing else is going to happen, so there's the two stone. And now every other player in T order moves up to two clerks to any two different locations. Well, we know that the Reed Clan, come the end of his command step, is going to perform an advanced activation in the lumber mill of the gold mine in the temple. It makes sense for me to place clerks in those locations because they're going to get activated and then they're going to return to me right away. So I will go ahead and place a clerk in the gold mine and I'll place a clerk in the temple. Before I do that, can you predict what Chin's going to do? He's going to place a clerk in the gold mine and because his second clerk has to be in a different location, it's going to go in the temple as well. 
Now I'm going to place my other clerk in the temple, and Chin is going to do the same thing. And now we're at the point where the Reed clan activates, advance activates all the locations where he has a clerk present. Since I'm the overlord, I get to choose the order in which all this happens. And that could be important if you want to be sure you have the resources you need to, say, upgrade an overseer, for example, at another location. I think I only really care about upgrading my gold mine overseer for the moment. And I do have the stone that I need. Let me just take a peek to make sure about that. Yeah, I have four stone. Uh, so, frankly, the order in which we activate these locations probably won't matter that much. I'll activate the lumber mill first. That's going to be simple. The only thing that's going to happen is that the reclan is going to donate one wood to the warehouse. Otherwise, his clerk stays there and nothing else happens. Uh, at the gold mine, first I'm going to collect two gold, one for my clerk plus one for my overseer. Chin is going to score one honor point for his one clerk. One clerk times his overseer's level of one equals one. And then I'll have the opportunity to upgrade my overseer by paying three additional stone. Gold mine next. So there's my two gold. Chin just scored a, uh, an honor point. And now, do I want to upgrade my overseer at the gold mine at a cost of three stone? Uh, yes. Do I want to donate one gold that I just gained to the warehouse to score two honor? Uh, I think I'm going to decline again. But of course, the Reed Clan will donate one gold, as he always does. And then that leaves the temple to be advanced activated. Once again, I will gain one chi. Chin will score one honor. And nothing else happens. I will have the opportunity to hire an overseer, but I don't think I'm going to. I want to save my gold. Every time a location activates where Chin has a clerk present, we rearrange the tokens in the location track. So when we activated the lumber mill, the wood token moved to the left. When we activated the gold mine, the gold token moved to the left. And now as we're activating the temple, the Chi token moves to the left. The order in which I choose to activate locations could potentially affect uh, what the chin does on future turns. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So I'm going to decline to hire an overseer at the temple, so nothing else happens. Then we move on to the activation step, but there is nothing to do at this point. Nothing's going to happen during the activation step. And nothing happens during the uh, Horde Defeat Check step. So now we are finally moving into the Winter Phase. And the first step in the Winter Phase is the Firing Phase, or the Archer Firing Phase. Every Archer that's on the walls gets to fire one more arrow. So that's one of the benefits of the Archer. Remember when the Archer shoots when you first recruit it, you place a wound token so you're not getting a resource when you do that. However, the benefit of archers on the wall is that they get to fire twice, once when they're recruited and once again during the firing phase. So I'm going to get to place another wound token for my archer on the third wall section. Recall I'm not going to get any resource or honor by doing so. I'm going to only be covering up a spot on the, on the horde card. So I am going to do this, and I will cover, uh, I guess I'll just cover this gold spot here. There's another Horde Defeat check step after the firing phase, but there are no Horde cards that are fully covered, so nothing happens. 
So the next phase that's really going to matter is that we resolve the horde assaults. For each wall section that's active, we add up the offense of all the horde cards, compare it to our defense, and if the offense is higher than the defense, then the horde breaches the wall. Otherwise, nothing happens. For now, at least, nothing's going to happen in either wall section. Our six defense matches the six offense of the pikemen, and our 14 defense over here, six for the barricades and eight for the wall section, easily handle the eight offense of the brutes. Of course, you're probably wondering what happens if and when a wall is breached. We'll see that happen in due time, I promise. I'll make sure there's going to be a wall breach before this tutorial is over. Next thing that happens in the winter phase is that all the barricades get discarded because the winter just destroys them. So uh, if you want barricades in the future, you're going to have to build them. Finally, you check for the end of the game. There are three possible ways the game can end at this stage. One, if two of the wall sections are fully erected to the third level, that's, that's a check you make in the when you're playing solo or a two-player game or, frankly, a three-player game. Even if you're playing with three human players in a three-player game and you're using all three wall sections, only two of them have to be fully built to end the game at this step. The other thing that ends the game is if we're in round six or year six, the other case that could possibly end the game prematurely is if the shame pool is empty. This is going to bring us into the spring, and the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to advance the token on the time track to round two. And now we place new whore cards. The number of whore cards that get placed or added is shown to the left or above, depending on which way you're looking at it, the time track. So there is a set of numbers here to the left that indicates that in round two, one new whore card is added. In round three and round four, two new whore cards are added. In round five, three new horde cards, and in round six, four new horde cards are added. Now, when a horde card is added, you first look to see if there's a free space to place it in the front of the wall sections. In our game, we're ignoring this first wall section, and these two spots are full, so we don't have to worry about that case. So the one horde card we're going to draw is going to be placed based on the invasion indicator of the horde card that's on top of the deck after we draw the next horde card. So we're going to draw this one that currently shows, uh, that the, shows the rightmost wall, but once we draw that card, a new horde card is going to be on top of the deck, indicating possibly a different wall section. So it's possible that either the next horde card will go here, or we'll go here. It's going to the right. So the uh, with one more whore card removed, the next whore card on top of the deck still shows that uh, the invasion indicator points to the rightmost wall section. So we drew an assassin's horde card, and that got placed behind the brutes in the third wall section. And you can see assassins. Uh, has offense of 8 and awards 5 honor points if it's claimed. And it has a special ability that says that soldiers who are killed on this ward card can't be saved. Now we haven't seen how you how soldiers are killed yet or how and how they're saved, but uh to keep in mind that as far as assassins is concerned, you can't save soldiers there. They they just decimate them. Now, I will say that if the invasion indicator indicates that a horde card should be placed in a wall section that's completely full, that already has three horde cards in it, 
When that happens, a raid occurs. What you do is you just discard the whore card that you just drew that you couldn't place, and you simply permanently remove from the game a number of shame tokens from the shame pool equal to the number of human players. So if ever we have a raid, the whore card that got drawn will simply be set aside or discarded, and one more shame will be removed from the shame pool, and that would just be returned to the game box. That is currently not a problem we're immediately faced with. We've got plenty of room here in the middle wall section, one space remaining in the third wall section, so it's not a problem that's a, that's a problem yet, but it might be, become a problem soon enough. I should also say that if you do have a raid and you do take a, a shame token out of the shame pool, if you happen to reduce the shame pool to zero at that point, you still play out the rest of the round, the, play, the all four phases. You don't check for the end of the game until the end of the winter phase. The next thing that happens is that the advisor track is refreshed. You take the left two advisors on the advisor track and discard them. However, if you're playing a solo game, you do take one of them, flip it over, and add it to Chin as another supporting advisor. So he's always getting a steady stream, one way or another, of supporting advisors. He's currently at two supporting advisors. He's going to get a third one right now, as soon as we refresh the advisor track. So the first two cards are discarded. One goes under Chin. As a third supporting advisor, all the other ones slide to the left, and we draw new advisors to fill the display. So we have the informant here and the logistician. Now we're moving into the summer phase, the overseer income step. In the Overseer Income step, every human player gains a number of resources based on their Overseer and its level. I only have one Overseer, and it is in this level 2, so I'm going to gain 2 gold during the Overseer Income step. However, if you recall, my General says gain 2 gold for every supporting advisor you have. So I'm going to gain an additional two gold for a total of four. So I'm going to go from three to seven. Next step, discard shame tokens. Each player, well, each human player who has gained any shame has the opportunity to get rid of that shame by paying two chi per shame token that they want to get rid of. I could afford to get rid of the shame token if I wanted to, but it's not really bothering me too much at this point. There's still nine shame tokens in the pool, plenty of time in the game, so I'm not overly worried about that shame token right now. I certainly have plenty of spearmen, so I'm not going to bother to discard any shame at this point. That brings us to the discard command card step. All cards on the command track are discarded, except, of course, for the Reed Clan, who only has one command card, so that gets returned to it. Incidentally, I show discarded uh, command cards up here, so you can see there's my Despotism card and uh, Chin's Work Harder card that are sitting in the discard pile, wherever you want to put that. The next step is to reclaim command cards. Each human player has the option to reclaim your discarded command cards. You're going to gain two honor for every discarded command card. Now, if you reclaim them, and one of them happened to be Betrayal, if you recall, Betrayal is one of those command cards you can never reclaim. So you could still potentially gain two honor. Chin never reclaims his command cards unless otherwise told to. So we're both basically going to gain two honor right now for each of our one discarded command cards. I am not going to reclaim. And that brings us back to where we were before 
the choose command card step. This round I want to try to focus on how some of the other locations work and what happens when you defeat a horde card. I think I'm going to choose to play raise banners as my command card. And Chin randomly chooses despotism. And now we're through the range command card step. So there are all the command cards. I get to choose first because I'm at the top of the T order. Once again, I will decide to go first. Chin will go second. Reclan automatically takes the last free spot, which is third. Ready's banner says move up to three of your clerks to any locations. For each despotism card on the command track, oh, lo and behold, there is one, you can move one additional clerk. So I'm going to be able to place four clerks instead of three. Once I do that, other players will be able to move up to two clerks to any two different locations as usual. And notice in the third step, there is no specific action that takes place, but it does say that during this activation step, each of your clerks in the barracks counts as two clerks. And you can ignore the shame penalty in the barracks if you're the only player that has clerks there. So those are the advantages of playing raised banners. I get to place four clerks. I'm going to put one in the barracks. I'm going to put one in the War Academy. I want to show you how that works. And for now, at least, I'm going to put two in the gold mine because I just want to keep a steady supply of gold coming into my coffers. What's Chin going to do when it's his turn? Well, his first clerk is going to go into the quarry and his second clerk is going to go to the barracks. And then because I'm the overlord, I get to choose what the reed clan will do. So my next clerk is going to go in the gold mine, and Chin's going to go to the quarry in the barracks. And now Chin will go to the quarry and the barracks. And now as overlord, I choose what I want the reed clan to do. Let's have the reed clan leave the temple and go to the barracks. Well, War Academy is not going to activate it unless I have a clerk there. So let's bring the clerk from the reclaimed clerk from the lumber mill and move it to the War Academy. So at least that location activates and I can demonstrate uh, what, what it does. Oh, and now it's the end of my command step and Jinchi gets to let me place one additional clerk which happens to be the last clerk I have available to me. I may regret not recruiting that extra clerk when I could, when I was at the Emperor's Embassy. I think for now, I've got plenty of gold. There's five gold in the, in the warehouse. I think I'm going to send a, that clerk over to the builder's encampment. Which brings us to the activation step. So we're looking at activating the barracks, the war academy, and the builder's encampment in the order of my choosing. I'll activate the war academy first. For each clerk you have at the war academy, you can draw one tactic card. Now, Since I only have one clerk there, I'm only going to draw one tactic card. And because the read plan does nothing with tactic cards, it does nothing when it has clerks at the war academy. So the only reason for my putting them there was so that the location would activate. So let's go ahead and activate and see what I get. I get an Emperor's Gift tactic. So let's talk a little bit about tactic cards. These are special cards you can play at certain times during the game to break the rules or change something about the way the game plays. In the case of the Emperor's Gift, it says you can play this when you attack with your soldiers. Double the, the resource reward for two of your attacking soldiers. However, if you pay two additional chi, you can boost the effect of the Emperor's Gift and play 
so that when you attack with your soldiers, you can double the rewards for all of your attacking soldiers, assuming that you are attacking with more than two. All tactic cards work that way. They have a normal effect, and then they have a boosted effect. There are 20 cards in the core game tactic deck. Of course, 19 right now, since I just drew one. I'm not sure if I'm going to be drawing any other uh, tactic cards over the course of the game, so let's just take a quick look at what some of the other ones do. There is a heroic fight that says when a Horde card is defeated, if you have at least one Spearman on the defeated Horde card and at least one Archer in the same wall section, you can gain four honor. If you boost the tactic card by paying two Chi, you can gain eight honor instead. Reinforcement says that when you deal the last wound to a Horde card, you can gain four honor. If you boost it, and you deal the last wound to a Horde card, gain 8 honor instead. Again, the cost to boost it is 2 Chi. Rob the Dead says when you deal the last wound to a Horde card, gain 2 of any resource. When you, and if you boost it with 2 Chi, when you deal the last wound to a Horde card, gain 5 of any resource. Which means you're really gaining 3 of any resource because you just paid two chi to boost the effect. And withdrawal says when any of your soldiers are killed, you can save one soldier for free. And if you boost the tactic card, it says when any of your soldiers are killed, you can save all of your soldiers in a single wall section for free. When you play tactic cards, you can only play them one at a time per instance or per thing that's happening in the game. So for example, if I'm attacking a Horde card, I can't play two Emperor's Gifts to, to quadruple the reward I might get. Uh, the hard hand limit of tactic cards is five. So if you ever draw a six, you have to discard one from your hand. When you do play a tactic card, you obviously place it in a discard pile so that if you ever run out of tactic cards, you can shuffle that pile and to form a new deck. All right, so let's uh, get out of that. I have an Emperor's Gift, so the next time I attack, I'll probably plan on using that to gain some additional gold. You can't use it to double honor, notice, only the resource reward. I will activate the barracks next. So even though I only have one clerk in the barracks, Remember, Raise Banners allows me to treat each of my clerks as if I had two. So this is actual, actually perfect timing. I think I'm going to recruit uh, two Spearmen. Normally I would only be able to recruit one soldier, but Raise Banners lets me recruit two. They're both going to be Spearmen. It's going to cost me a total of four stone and two wood. I've got the two wood, I've got one stone, fortunately gold is wild, so I'll pay three gold to make up the difference. And now before I place those spearmen, I am going to uh, use my Emperor's Gift tactic card. I'm not going to boost it, because I'm only attacking with two soldiers, there's no need to boost it. So now, when I cover up gold spots, I will double my reward. Unfortunately, I kind of did something stupid here. I probably should not have covered this gold with a, with a wound token when I was attacking with my archer. So unfortunately, I'm only going to gain two gold. Boy, that, that kind of burns. So I gained two gold instead of one gold for that. And now placing this other Spearman is going to get me two honor. That does not double. And then my tactic card's gone. It's in the discard pile. Chin does what he normally does. He attacks uh, based on the invasion indicator. So he attacks the Brutes card. First spot. And now what? Uh, because the Reed Clan has a clerk at the barracks, I get to place the Reed Clan Spearman, and that's going to go in the last spot. Of course, uh, 
Chin gained two honor for that placement of the Spearman. And now we're activating the Builder's Encampment, where you can either, for each clerk you place there, build a barricade or build a wall. The cost of a barricade is two resources of any type. The cost of a wall, we've already seen, is either 5, 10, or 15, depending upon what level of the wall it happens to be. When you're building a wall or a barricade, you first pay the funds on whatever happens to be in the warehouse. So uh, in my case, what am I going to do here? I think I'm going to build a wall in the uh, second, in the middle wall section, which would cost me five resources. There are five resources in the warehouse, so that's going to pay for it. And I get to gain, when I build a wall, or a barricade for that matter, one honor point for each resource that that wall or barricade would normally cost. So I'm basically paying nothing to gain five honor and build a wall. And now we're at the Horde Defeat Check Step, and finally we have a Horde that needs to be defeated. The Brutes card is about to go. If there happen to be multiple Horde cards that had to be defeated, you resolve them front to back, left to right. Front to back meaning closest to the wall, to farther away from the wall, and then you do them one wall section at a time from left to right. When you're resolving the Horde Defeat Check Step, each player who has at least one soldier on the Horde card is going to gain two honor. So in our case, both Chin and I are going to score two honor for our soldiers on, on the Brutes card. Reclaim doesn't score honor. Then each archer that's on the wall will score two honor for its owner. I've got one archer there, so that's an additional two honor for me. If you recall... Uh, the Chronicler says that each time a Horde card is defeated, I will score two honor if I have at least one soldier on that card. Well, I do, so there's another two honor that I'm going to score. So I'm going to get a total of six honor for this, and Chin's going to score two honor. Then the player who is covering the most spaces with his soldiers gets to claim the Horde card. So I'm covering a total of four spaces with my soldiers. The Reed Clan is covering two spaces with its two soldiers. If the Reed Clan, by the way, ever claims a horde card, it doesn't keep it, it just discards it because it doesn't score points. If Chin ever claims a horde card, it does claim it because it will score the points for the horde card at the end of the game. But in this case, I'm covering four spots the Reed Clan is covering two, and Chin is covering two, so I'm going to claim the Brutes card. Worth a total of eight honor at the end of the game, assuming I don't put any shame tokens on it. We'll see that in a second. So let's continue, and then you'll see what happens next. So I'm going to get a total of six honor. That should get me up to 17. Chin scores two honor. I claim the Brutes card. But now, soldiers are killed based on the lethality setting. The other column of numbers to the right of the round track is the current lethality setting for the current round. So in round two and round one, for that matter, the lethality setting is one. In rounds three and four, it's two. And in rounds five and six, it's three. During this Horde Defeat check step, one of my soldiers is going to be killed. However, any time a soldier is killed, you do have the option to save it, if you want to, by paying two chi per soldier that would otherwise be killed. If you do save a soldier that would otherwise be killed, it goes to the rest zone of that particular wall section. If you don't save the soldier and it's killed, killed soldiers return to your supply. All of your other soldiers that aren't affected or aren't killed or saved for that matter simply go to the rest zone of that particular wall section. Chin and the Reed Clan never bother keeping soldiers in the rest zone. After all, they don't pay for them to begin with. 
so all their soldiers, for ease of use, simply return to their supply. So since we know that one of my soldiers is going to die, I have now the option of paying two chi to save it. Considering I've got both a horseman there and a spearman there, I, it's, it would cost me more to recruit them again than to rescue them. I do have one chi available, and then otherwise I have gold. So I'm going to pay the two chi to save my soldiers. So none of them are going to die. Therefore, my two spearmen and my horsemen are going to go to the rest zone of the third wall section, and all the other soldiers belonging to Chin and the Reed Clan will simply return to their respective supplies. So I'm saving my soldier. And there they are down there. And then the Brutes card is now in my possession. And all of the other cards that happen to be in that column simply slide closer to the wall. So Assassins has shifted down. If you take a look at the Brutes card, well, that's what it looks like in general. But when you put it in your player area, you place it face down. So it looks like this. Because the back on the back of every horde card, in addition to an invasion indicator, there are two spots where you can put shame tokens. Shame tokens placed on horde cards that are not otherwise placed under a soldier means that you're not disabling a soldier. Furthermore, shame tokens that are on a horde card won't cost you five honor at the end of the game. However, you also won't get the honor that you would otherwise get for the Horde card if there are any shame tokens on the back of it. If you have two shame tokens to place on the back of a Horde card, it pays to do it because those two shame tokens on the back of that Horde card are saving you from losing 10 honor. And the most honor that any one Horde card ever pays, I think, is 8. And that pretty much ends my turn. So now it is Chin's turn. Remember, he's playing Despotism. He's going to move the T-marker to the top of the T-track, his T-marker. And then he's going to place a number of clerks equal to the number of supporting advisors he has. Number one, he's going to move into first place in turn order, forcing me down to second place and reclaim into third place. And then he is going to place three clerks, and he is going to put two of them in the quarry, and then he's going to run out of space, so then he's going to put the other one in the lumber mill. So now he's at the top of the T-track, two of his clerks go to the quarry, the other one goes to the lumber mill, and now first I get to choose to place two clerks in two different locations, and then the Reed Clan will do that. But this time, uh, Chin is the overlord, so Chin is going to place the Reed Clan clerks the way he otherwise would do it. I'm going to place a clerk in the gold mine. I might as well place a clerk in the lumber mill, because I know that's going to get activated eventually when it's the Reed Clan's turn. Then I'm going to pause. And for the Reed Clan's turn, Chin is going to do what he otherwise would do. Well, he can't place anything into the quarry because it's full. He can get a Reed Clan clerk into the lumber mill. So he's going to move the clerk from the War Academy to the lumber mill. Because he, get, he, move, he relocates clerks that are not in any one of his five lo, key locations first. And then he's going to relocate the, the Reed Clan clerk in the barracks to the temple. Then he performs an advanced activation in the location with the highest number of your clerks. And I'm glad this card came up because it's important for me to clarify what that means. This has been a source of confusion. Whose clerks? Your clerks meaning you, the human player, or your clerks meaning Chin. The your actually refers to Chin's clerks. So we're going to, Chin is going to perform an advanced activation in the location with the most number of his clerks, which happens to be the quarry. So that's going to get activated right away as part of his command step. If there was a tie, 
he would break the tie based on the whichever location happened to be lower on his location track. So if, say, he had two uh, clerks in the quarry and two clerks in the lumber mill, well, he would still choose to advance activate the quarry because the quarry, uh, the stone, is lower than the wood is on his location track. All right, so we know he's going to advance activate the quarry. Therefore, he's going to score three points, three times one, and then all his clerks are going to go back to his uh, supply. And now we get to the activation step for Chin. But there is nothing to activate again. The gold mine's not full, the lumber mill's not full, the temple's not full, and there are no other clerks anywhere to worry about in special locations, so nothing happens there. Nothing happens in the Horde Defeat Check step, so his turn comes to an end, and now it's the Reed Clan's turn. Shin is higher in turn order, so he's going to continue to play the Overlord here, and he's going to decide what the Reed Clan does. So as usual, two stones going to go from the source supply to the, to the warehouse. There's not enough there to build a wall section, so nothing's going to happen there. And next, every other player in T order gets to place two clerks. Well, Chin is going to place one clerk in the lumber mill and one clerk in the gold mine. And then it'll be my turn. So two stone, then Chin places one lumber mill, one in the gold mine. Two stone. Lumber mill, gold mine, and now it's my turn. And, oh, and please be aware, you only have one clerk in your supply. Okay, see, this is where I probably should not have uh, recruited Jinchi and should have stuck with my original plan to get an additional clerk. Because even though I can place two, I really can place only one and relocate one if I want to. Well, I've got three in the gold mine. That's going to activate in the activation step, so I'm happy about that. I've got one in the lumber mill. That will activate, so I'm happy about that. I'll place my one and only clerk in the temple, since I know that's going to activate. I could go to the barracks, but I think uh, I might as well take advantage of the temple while, it can, while it's activating. And now uh, Chin's going to uh, go through the activation step. He activates from high to low. So the temple activates first. He gets one honor. I gain one chi. So I got my one chi. And now I could recruit a, an overseer if I want to for two gold. I am going to decline. Now he's activating the gold mine. He gains uh, one honor there. I gain three gold. And do I want to upgrade my overseer at the gold mine for four stone? I am going to do that. I'm going to get my overseer to the top spot. And I can donate to the warehouse for two honor. I'm going to decline again. I don't think I want to. Of course, the Reed Clan will. And now the Lumber Mill activates. Chin gets two honor. I get one wood. And uh, I am not going to hire an overseer, and I am not going to donate. But the Reed Clan will. And now that brings us to the activation step. And once again, there are no other locations that need to be activated, so nothing happens. No Horde cards need to be defeated, so nothing happens in the Horde Defeat Check step, so that brings the Fall Phase to the end. So now we're back to the Winter Phase, the Firing Step, the Firing Phase. I still have my Archer over here, so that Archer is going to fire, and I'm going to... Well, I can't get the gold, unfortunately. So I'm just going to cover up uh, one of the uh, two honor spaces. And 
another whore defeat check step, nothing happens. Then the assaults are resolved. So what do we got? Six against eight, eight against eight. We're good. There are no barricades to discard. The game doesn't end. And we're going to advance the time track to round three. And now we're placing two new whore cards. So we're going to draw a whore card from the deck of 13, depending on the invasion indicator on the card below the one we're about to draw. And then we're going to draw on that one and check the new invasion indicator and place it accordingly. So, worst possible case is we're going to put both of them in the same wall section, but we're not going to have a raid because we have uh, two spaces available in both wall sections currently. So, let's see what we get. They both go into the middle wall section. We have a spies car here, and we have an infantry card here. A total offense of 19 against our lowly defense of eight. So we're probably looking at a breach sooner here rather than later. The nice thing is that the current horde card on top of the deck is pointing to the middle wall section so that if and when Chin recruits soldiers at the barracks or does any sort of attack, he is going to give preference to the middle wall section rather than the, the rightmost wall section, which is good for us. Now we refresh the advisor track. Left two cards get discarded. One more supporting advisor for Chin, bringing him up to four supporting advisors, and then two new advisors get drawn. Overseer income step. I'm going to get three gold plus an additional two for my general for a total of five gold. So like bringing me from six gold up to 11. Another opportunity to discard shame tokens. Actually, you know what? Before I get to that step, let me take a moment to, uh, to show you what the other whore cards look like, uh, just so you know. So... Um, uh, there's arsonists where the defense value of your barricades in that wall section is zero because the arsonists burn them down. We've already seen assassins. You can't save soldiers on an assassin horde card. Brutes doesn't have any special effect. Infantry doesn't have any special effect. The leader card says the defense value of this wall section is halved, rounded down. And that the effect is cumulative, meaning that if you have two leaders, you take your defense value, divide by two, round down, and then you divide by two again and round down again. So in my case, if I happen to have two leaders here in the middle wall section, my defense of eight would actually be eight divided by two divided by two, which would be two. Uh, pikemen don't have any special uh, effect, though it is interesting to point out that uh, you can't place horsemen on a pikeman card because there are no adjacent spaces, horizontally or vertically, which makes sense because pikemen use their pikes to kill the horses. So uh, that uh, all this makes thematic sense if you spend some time thinking about it. Their shield bearers, I mentioned shield bearers, uh, can't be attacked by archers. And once again, their spies, no special effect. There are a, a whole nother set of uh, whore cards that come into play if you're playing co-op. Uh, maybe in a future video, I'll, I'll show a, a co-op playthrough and do the same thing I did here. Anyway, we're at the discard shame token step. Again, I'm going to pass on that and not bother. Cancel. Command cards get discarded. So now uh, both Chin and I have two cards in the discard pile up there. Now we can reclaim disc command cards. I'm not going to. 
and Chin never does. So we're both going to score a total of four honor for our two discarded command cards each. No. And we're back to the choose command card step. This time I'm going to choose work harder. And Chin chooses betrayal. Because Chin is first in the order, he is going to take the top spot. So I'll decide to go second, and the Re Clan will go third. And uh, Chin goes first with betrayal. So the first thing that his card says is that he hires the leftmost advisor and makes it another supporting advisor. So now his supporting advisors are going to go up to five and then he moves a number of clerks equal to his number of supporting advisors to lowest locations then he reclaims all of his command cards so that's the one way that chin can reclaim his command cards so he reclaims the two that he's discarded but the betrayal is not going to be reclaimed it never can be reclaimed it's going to stay in the discard pile so he's going to be placing five clerks, and it appears that two are going to go to the temple, and then three are going to go to the barracks. So at least he's going to do his fair share of attacking this turn. Now each other player can move two clerks to any two different locations. Well, we know that uh, Chin is going to have the Reed clan place one in the barracks and one in the quarry. So at least we know that the Reed clan will be activating the quarry coming up. I guess I'll play we'll place one clerk in the barracks. And uh, I do want to start demonstrating these other locations, so I'll place a clerk in the tea house. And now, Reed Clan, he moves one from the lumber mill to the barracks. The barracks is next in line because the temple's full. And then he wants uh, the next one to go to the quarry, so he's going to move the Reed Clan clerk in the gold mine to the quarry. And that brings us to the activation step, which means the temple's going to activate and the barracks is going to activate. T activates locations where he has clerks first. He has clerks in both, so we activate uh, highest to lowest. So he's going to activate the barracks first, and then he's going to activate the temple. At the barracks, he's first in T order. He is going to attack with three spearmen to the middle wall section. So he's going to go after the pikemen. Left to right, top to bottom, left to right. Now it's my turn. I have one clerk there. Well, I have no chance of winning the pikemen at this point because I know he's going to send a Reed Clan Spearman there. So maybe I'll recruit another Archer. Because I, at least that way I know I can fire one arrow now and then fire again during the firing phase. So I will recruit an Archer. It's going to cost two Chi and a Wood. Uh, or in my case, one Wood, one Chi, and one Gold. With that archer, since there are plenty, well, there are plenty of free firing spots in both locations, I'll go after these pikemen because I'm most worried about this middle wall section, of course. So I'll just take the next firing, the next uh, vital space on the pikemen and attack that with a wound token. Then he's going to send the reed clan spearmen to the next space. So that's the end of Chin's turn, and now it's my turn to play my Work Harder card that allows me to 
to basically move all of my clerks to locations. So unfortunately, I only have four clerks to place. I want to show you how the logistics center works, so I'll put one clerk up there. I'm going to put another clerk back at the Emperor's Embassy. I could place two in the builder's encampment to build, really build up the wall, but maybe add a barricade. But I think I'm going to let the breach happen for demonstration purposes. So I'm going to put another clerk in the Emperor's Embassy. And my last clerk will go to the gold mine, as usual, for some extra gold. And then all other players get to move uh, two clerks to any two locations. So Chin is going to place one clerk in the quarry and one in the gold mine. And now Chin goes to the quarry and the gold mine. And now I get to choose what the Reed Clan does. I want that tea house to activate, so I'm going to have the Reed Clan move this clerk from the quarry to the tea house to force it to activate. And I'll move its clerk from the temple to the gold mine to ensure that the gold mine gets activated during the Reed Clan's turn. And now Jinchi <laughs> lets me place another clerk, but I have no clerks <laughs> to place. I could re uh, relocate one, but I'm happy where my clerks are, so I'm going to move on to my activation step. So we've got the tea house, the emperor's embassy, and the logistics center. Let's choose to activate the tea house first. What happens in in tea order? Each player who has a clerk at the tea house gets to move their T marker one step higher than it currently is. So I'm going to move into first place, and the Reed Clan is going to move into second place, and we're going to push Chin all the way back to the end of the line. Notice if you're already at the top of the T track, there is absolutely no benefit for you to send a clerk there because you will go first and you're already at the top of the T track, so there's no place for you to move your T marker. So you're Basically, our clerk is wasted. Okay, we're going to activate the tea house. The new order is me, then Reed Clan, then Chin. The Logistics Center lets you, for each clerk you have there, it lets you redeploy soldiers from one wall section to another wall section. I'm obviously going to be moving soldiers out of the rightmost wall section into the middle wall section. And what do I want to move here? I think I'm going to leave my spearmen where they are on the right. So I'm not going to move any spearmen. I will move my one horseman to the middle wall section. And I could move my archer from here over to here. Then why not? Because I know the pikeman is about to drop, and I'm gonna I would score two honor for each of my archers in firing spots in that wall section, so I'm gonna move my archer over here. And now we're activating the Emperor's Embassy. First thing I'm gonna do is pay two gold of two of my ten to get another clerk. So now I have two clerks in the Emperor's Embassy and three clerks in my supply. And now, I, in order to recruit another advisor, I have to pay a total of one, two, three, plus one, or four gold. And I want this advisor to be a supporting advisor. Cost me a total of four gold. And now my turn is over, and it's the Reed Clan's turn, and I am the Overlord, so I get to decide what uh, the Reed Clan does. Two stone, get at it. He can't build a wall because it would cost 10 resources to build the next wall section. And now you kind of have an idea as to why I have not been donating to the, the warehouse, mostly because 
I want to build the wall section and uh, I don't want the reclaim to do it because I want to get the honor for it. If the reclaim builds a wall section, the honor goes to waste. Of course, I would get honor for donating. Uh, so now uh, the other two players get to choose where they want to place a clerk, and then the reclaim is going to advance activate the locations that he's in. Well, I'm going to put another clerk in the gold mine. And I might as well come up to the barracks here so we can create a little bit of an offensive. And Chin is going to place in the quarry and the, gold, the last spot on the gold mine. And now the Reed Clan advance activates all the locations that he occupies. Interestingly enough, one of them is the tea house, so he's going to move in the first place and bump me down to second place. So I'll do that first. Now he's in first place. We'll activate the gold mine. So two, two honor is going to go to Chin, and I'm going to get a total of five gold. No. At the barracks, well, the Reed Clan's first up. I'm the overlord, so I get to choose what he does. So I'll have him finish off the pikemen. And uh, now I get to recruit one soldier. I will recruit my other horseman. I'm going to attack uh, spies for one gold and two armor. Activation step. Nothing activates during the reclaims activation step. So the pikeman is going to get uh, knocked off. Let's continue. So two honor for Chin. Four honor for my archers. So at least I get that. And then everything else slides down. So my two archers are going to fire. And uh, I don't get any benefit from those, so I'll just place them here. And then there's going to be a breach because we've got 13 against 8. When a breach occurs, for every horde card in that wall section that's breaching, where you don't have a soldier, you are going to gain one shame. So I'm going to gain one shame for infantry, but not for spies, because I have a horseman there. The next thing that happens is that all the archers in the on firing spots are killed as well, although you have the option to save them if you want and move them to the rest zone at a, at a cost of two chi per soldier you want to save otherwise they get returned to your supply and then a number of soldiers on each horde card will die based on the lethality setting so two on infantry well i have nobody there i've already gained a shame token for that and i am going to lose my horseman though i can pay chi to rescue that horseman as well the first thing that's going to happen is that I think the archers are killed first. Yes, they are. So uh, I can pay four chi to rescue them. If I wanted to save all three of these soldiers, I would have to pay a total of six chi. I only have six gold. I guess I'd prefer to save the horsemen over one of the archers anyway. Because I don't want to spend all my gold. I'll pay two chi to save one archer, and then the other one will return to my supply. So one goes to the rest zone, and one goes back to my supply. Now I gain a shame token for the fact that I don't have soldiers on the infantry card, so I'll put that under one of my spearmen. No, actually, I'll put it on one of them on the back of my brutes card for now.
And now, do I want to save that horseman? Yes, I'll pay two chi to save him. He goes to the rest zone. The spaces he was covering get replaced with wound tokens, and nothing happens in the third wall section. The wall holds because we're okay there. That brings us to the discard barricade step. There are no barricades to discard. And nothing happens at the check end of game step. I'm going to advance the time track to the fourth round. And now two more horde cards are going to be placed. Potentially I could suffer a raid here if uh, both of them end up in the middle wall section. Let's see. Uh, I get one over the, yeah, I get one in each. So uh, no raid occurs, but if there was a raid, one more shame token would have been discarded. So I want to demonstrate the attack order card. Uh, that's a, an unusual command card that does things a little differently from the, from the command cards you've seen so far. So let's, let's keep playing just a little bit here. So we'll continue. Uh, we'll refresh the advisor track. Another supporting advisor for Chin. He's up to six now. Then the overseer income step. So I gain three for this overseer plus four now because I have two supporting advisors for a total of seven gold. That's nice. So I'm up to nine gold. Uh, I could discard shame tokens if I wanted to. Maybe I will. Now that I have nine gold, I will go ahead and discard that shame token for two gold and discard this shame token for two gold. Now the command cards get discarded. So I have three discarded command cards. I'm going to gain six honor, and uh, Chin will gain two honor. I'm not going to reclaim. I will choose attack war because I want to demonstrate that. And Chin chooses despotism. I guess he wasn't happy being at the bottom of the T order track because despotism is the card he uses to uh, move back to the top of the T order track. The Reed clan is going to go first. That's unusual. I'll go second, and Chin will go last. So the Reed clan deposits two stone into the warehouse. He's just shy of being able to build a wall, so he doesn't build a wall. And now I get to place two clerks, and Chin gets to place two clerks. I'm going to place a clerk in the builder's encampment so I can do the honors. And my other clerk will go in the gold mine. And then we know the chin is going to go to the quarry and the lumber mill. Reed Clan performing an advanced activation in every location where he has a clerk. So only one location really has to activate, and why is that? He has one clerk in the barracks, but there is the rule that if the Reed Clan is the only clerk in a special location, it doesn't activate, even if it's advanced activation. So the barracks is not going to activate because the Reed Clan is the only player there. Technically, the tea house does activate, but... The Reed Clan's already in first place, so nothing would happen there. The gold mine is the only thing that has to we have to worry about. I am going to gain four gold. The Reed Clan is going to donate one gold to the warehouse. And now, because I know I'm going to be building the wall, I might as well donate to get the benefit of that honor.
Now we're at the activation step. We have the quarry and the builder's encampment that have to activate. We'll get the quarry out of the way. That's basically three honor for Chin. And now the builder's encampment. I guess I will add a wall, a level to the middle wall section where we need it the most at the moment. Uh, all ten of that, ten of those resources will be paid by the warehouse, but I'll gain ten honor. That brings the defense up to 12 here, still not enough to hold off the horde. So now my attack order card gets activated. First thing that happens on my attack order is that I get to recruit one spearman for free, and for each raised banners card on the command track, I can recruit an additional spearman for free. Well, there are no raised banners cards out there, so I get to recruit one spearman for free. I think I will go for the gold space on spies. Get another gold. Now, I can choose one wall section and attack with all the soldiers that I have there, meaning all the soldiers I have in the rest zone, as well as archers that may be on the wall. I'm going to start with my horsemen. That'll gain me a chi and two honor. With my other horsemen, another four honor. And now my archer, there are plenty of firing spots. So the archer moves out of the rest zone onto the firing spot. Remember, if there weren't any empty firing spots for my archer to move into, then he would have been stuck in the rest zone and would not have been able to attack. All other players can attack with two soldiers in a wall section of their choice, or they can recruit a spearman for free. Reclans first. So Reclan, I'll have finish off spies. Actually, let me think. I'll actually have the Reed Clan, I think, attack assassins, and I'll let Chin finish off spies. Not sure it makes a big difference, but. And now I get to attack with the rest of my soldiers. So attack with all other soldiers in all remaining wall sections. So my two spearmen over here in the third wall section will attack. I'll take a gold and two honor. Oh, and now I get to finally place with Jinchi. Forgot about him. So I'll go to the barracks so that uh, both re Reed and I will get to place more spearmen and do some more damage. Activation step happens. Barracks gets activated. It's the only one to activate. Going after assassins. Now I can uh, choose one soldier to recruit. And that's going to be a Spearman, I think. So, yeah, I will take the Chi. Horde defeat check step. Spies is going to get taken care of. I easily claim that card. Chin and I will each score uh, two honor. I'm going to get two honor for my archer, and I'm going to get the uh, two honor for a chronicler, and I'm going to claim the spies card. And now two soldiers are going to get killed. We'll cover that in a second, but let's just make sure everything worked the way it was supposed to. We've got two honor for my soldiers. Two honor for my archer. Chin got two honor. 
I got two on her for Chronicler, and I claim the card. Okay. Two of my soldiers will be killed. I'll choose to save both of them, paying two chi and two gold. So both of my horsemen and my spearmen will return to the rest zone in the middle wall section, and Chin's spearman will return to his supply. Now it's Chin's turn. He's going to move to the top of the T-track, pushing the Reed Clan into second place and me into last place. And then he's going to play six clerks. Three will go to the lumber mill and three will go to the barracks. Then all other players get to place in two different locations. Reed Clan goes first. Chin's the overlord. He wants the Reed Clan in the lumber mill. Well, that's full. The barracks, the Reed Clan's already there. And the temple. And the gold mine. So he is going to move the Reed Clan clerk out of the tea house and move it to the temple. And that's it. My turn, I'm going to place in the barracks. I could go back to the tea house. Yeah, I don't like getting stuck in last place. I'll go back to the tea house. He activates the lumber mill. That's four points for him. That was an advanced activation. And now his activation step will be at the barracks. So the invasion indicator points to the middle wall section. So he is attacking there with all of his spearmen and with the Reed Clan spearmen. And I will recruit, I want to finish off this Assassin's card, so I'll recruit an archer and attack one of these spots. Nothing happens in the Horde Defeat check step, but I will finish off Assassins in the firing phase. And I'll get to shoot off another uh, archer shot here on um, infantry. Now in this Horde Defeat check step, Assassins will get wiped out and that's my card as well. That was probably six honor for me. Two, four, six. And uh, we're safe in the assault phase. And that's probably a good place to stop, but there are a couple of things I want to talk about before we wrap up. First of all, I want to uh, talk about the other command cards that we haven't discussed. My Betrayal command card lets me copy the effects of any other command card that's on the command track. I cannot copy the Reed Clans card, but I can copy, for example, since I'm playing solo, what uh, Chin Ju Shao plays, potentially, as long as he doesn't play Betrayal. Alternatively, I can simply move two of my clerks to any locations. And like his betrayal, my betrayal cannot be reclaimed. The economy card, may, I may upgrade uh, one overseer for free. That also means I can hire an overseer for free. Same thing. Then I can move three clerks to any locations, plus an additional clerk for each work harder card on the command track. And then every other player moves two clerks to two different locations. Taking a look at uh, 
Chin, his attack order card, he compares Stone and Chi, and if Chi is higher, he recruits and attacks with archers. If Stone is higher, he recruits and attacks with spearmen. And then all other players can attack with up to two soldiers in any one wall section. That would apply to me. Or recruit one spearman for free. Clearly, that's what the uh, Reed Clan would do. His economy card is where he gets to upgrade his overseers. So he upgrades all of them. So he would move into second level in each of the four locations. Then he would uh, place supporting advisor number of clerks, and all of the players would move, place two clerks in two different locations. Race Banners is interesting. He defeats all horde cards that have a, a number of not wounded spots less than the number of his supporting advisors. So he would, defeat means he, he would claim those horde cards even if he didn't have the majority of vital spaces covered. If he's not able to defeat any horde card, he simply recruits a number of uh, spearmen equal to the number of his supporting advisors, and then he moves up to that many clerks to the lowest location. So this is a pretty powerful card for, uh, for him. Other players move up to two clerks to any two different locations, and of course we've seen work harder. Finally, at the end of the game, you lose five honor for each shame token under a soldier, but you don't lose five honor for shame tokens on horde cards, as I've already discussed. You gain the honor of all horde cards that you have no shame tokens on. Now the maximum honor that you can get from a horde card, I believe, is eight. If you have two shame tokens on the back of a horde card, that's effectively worth 10 points. So if for some reason you couldn't pay off that shame, if you didn't have enough chi to pay it off, you might as well leave both shame on the back of a horde card because not losing 10 points is better than gaining eight or fewer points. And then finally, something we haven't talked about yet. At the beginning of the game, three artifact cards were drawn at random. Artifact cards are in-game scoring cards that uh, provide uh, honor to the extent that you fulfill them. So in my case, they've been sitting up here, and I haven't been looking at them at all. We have Servant Statue gains seven honor for each supporting advisor you have above two. So if I had known about that, I might have bypassed Chinchi and just pushed hard on supporting advisors. Dark Armor, you earn points for soldiers in rest zones or on horde cards at the end of the game. Jewel of Nua, you get three honor for each level of overseer. So for my gold mine overseer, for example, Jewel of Nua would be worth nine points but that would have encouraged me to hire overseers in the other locations as well. When it comes to Qin Zhishao, he, he scores a flat 20 points for every artifact card. So he's effectively scoring 60 points at the end of the game. So you better be ahead by a wide margin if you want to beat him. As you would expect, if there happens to be a tie at the end of the game, T order breaks the tie. And I think that pretty much covers just about everything I wanted to set out to talk about. Perhaps in future video, I'll do the same for the Black Powder expansion or co-op game. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and partial playthrough. As I said, if I made it any errors or had a bug in my program that caused it to do something incorrectly, I would love to hear about it in the comments. Uh, please like and subscribe. Check out some of my other playthroughs. Perhaps download some of the other programs I've made available thanks to the cooperation of the designers and publishers. The two programs that you can download are Obsession and Too Many Bones. And I think that wraps it up. This is long enough. Thanks for, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.